Ladies and gentlemen, stick around. We've got Ideas by Elliot. Hey, folks, you're listening to Ideas by Elliot. And we're here with Ideas by Elliot. Podcast, podcast, (laughs) podcast. Welcome to Ideas by Elliot, brought to you by Camera Corner Studios, Trisha Now Law, Release Wire, and Yikes Salon. Today's guest is the visionary mind behind Titletown Brewing Company, Brett Weicker. And your host, as always, web marketing guru, entrepreneur, extraordinaire, Elliot Christensen. So we have to cancel, though. We have to, we have to cancel this whole thing because uh, this jerk didn't bring me any beer. <laughs> That's true. Well, like, I have a business card I can like, see. Like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was coming to a school and it's not allowed on the premises. So we, we did joke when we had Z-Man on just a little bit ago uh, we, uh, that... If you showed up early, we're going to have a note on the outside that said, turn around and come back when you have beer. Uh, I would have grabbed some. <laughs> I, you should poke me. I didn't know what to expect. No, yeah. it's totally fine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I am uh, giddy with excitement. If you didn't read all my fo- Facebook I, I did see that praise, uh, I'm here with the president of Green Bay, <laughs> the visionary, like Nick said, of the second greatest attraction in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Wow. Thank you for being here, Brent. Thank you, Elliot. It's good to be here. Yeah. I have a billion questions that sure. I know that everybody wants to ask you. First, we'll start off with probably your favorite thing going on right now. So you're bottling new beers yep. and you got your new tap room. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, well, basically we opened back in 96 and like the rest of the craft beer world, we're kind of experiencing what a lot of people are doing where we kind of needed to make more beer. And um, we had been looking at the old Larson Canyon buildings that had been sitting vacant for I think about nine, ten years, and um, decided to partner with uh, our partners at Smet Construction and put in a new brewery over there along with some other offices and kind of renovate those old warehouses and put our new brewery over there, which gives us a lot more capacity. We put in a tap room over there. We've got a rooftop beer garden. We've got a little private event space. I like to call it our beer hall. So that's it's, the thing on the second floor. It's on the third floor, yeah. actually. Yep, yeah. yep. And again, just um, these were... Kind of these old uh, warehouses, you know, that just were hopefully not going to be destroyed. Like a lot of our old warehouses did get destroyed when, when I was a young kid. But we saved it, and uh, it's it's a, it's a great facility. And we just um, we got all the uh, we call the building buildings A and B filled, of which we're a big tenant of that. And then we're starting on C and B, which are two other ones that are just south of Kellogg Street. They're all connected, and they're just they're kind of creating a whole little community down there. I was at the tap room last night, like every night. Yeah, your and brother was there. <laughs> <laughs> and my brother has a, a group that he's starting for, yep. uh, you think I'm a nerd. This guy is the super nerd. Uh, <laughs> uh, like he, is, he is the king of the nerds of Green Bay. I defy anybody to repeat that. <laughs> and uh, so he has a group that's dedicated to cloud computing and artificial intelligence. I don't know if you knew that that's uh, what He kind of told me it was like a tech <laughs> tech. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he tried to go easy. On sure, you. sure. Uh, so with him, I went up and uh, we looked at Beer Hall. Yep. Like you called it. There's a stage. Yep. Awesome sound system. This is like world class. I'm super excited. He, he has his first meeting there in May. Yep. I can't wait. Like, oh, I'm super cool. excited to be up there yep. and see how, that, see, see how that goes. Yep. And the uh, views are great. Too. The view actually. Probably downtown, you know. So the view actually is great because uh, so I, it is actually an excellent view. I want to kind of go back to the beginning, mm-hmm. the beginning of Title Town, but we should sure. talk about the beginning of Brent, too. Yeah, that's a good story. What I think everybody wants to know is what took place in your shower that gave you the inspiration to do this? You're standing in the shower singing your favorite songs. Sure. Like everybody does. Sure. And you're like, I am going to create Green Bay's second greatest tourist attraction, and I am going to create Green Bay's beer mecca. Sure. How did that happen? Yeah, so, well, going back even a little farther, when I was growing up, my, um, we had a lot, of, we had restaurants in the family, drive ins to be specific. And while I don't remember, I'm like the youngest of all um, the grandchildren of my grandma's side. So I'm like the baby, I'm the youngest. There's no one else younger than me, and uh, other than the great grandchildren. But um, my uncle Barney had Barney's drive in. So growing up, everyone, like my older cousins, all worked there. My dad worked there, my aunts and uncles, my dad's brothers and sisters. Everybody worked at Uncle Barney's. And uh, Barney's had three drive-ins. One was actually on Broadway, and one was on Willow Street, which is now University, and the other one was on uh, Cass Street. The one on Cass Street is kind of where Blackstone is, and it used to be right next to the outdoor theater there. 
And then the one on Willow, which is now University, is still standing. It's a used car shop. And then the one on Broadway, unfortunately, got torn down a couple of years ago, which was a shame because it was kind of a really cool building. But that was his original site. Anyway, so just kind of always growing up, we, you know, we always had little notepads around the house that were Uncle Barney's order, you know, pads like you could order the Barney burger and malts and shakes and <laughs> a cherry pie. And anyway, uh, and then my grandmother owned the snowcap drive in, which was on Velp Avenue. So, and I remember that one. I actually was kind of the only restaurant we ever went to as a kid and stuff. And so I just always assumed like everybody's got a restaurant. You know, I, I think restaurants are always romantic and everybody wants to open them because they're. You know, they're easy to get into. Including Z-Man. Exactly. Oh, Z- did he have Z- a restaurant? No, he wanted to. Oh. That, that was his <laughs> thing. Thankfully, he found the guitar. Exactly. And we got, we got spared from that. Yeah. And, and like any business, it, it, it was tough. Uh, restaurants, unfortunately, have a higher failure rate, a little tougher. Uh, so anyway, you know, I kind of always had in my mind, like, you know, oh, you I should start your own business. My father had a trucking company. Anyway, so I just, when I was in college, I um, kind of didn't know what I was going to do with my life after graduation. I was dating a girl who's now my wife, Joanne. Anyway, I, I liked Green Bay. I wanted to stay here, and it was the brewery idea had just kind of come to me. I actually, I had a little stint with Walmart, actually. I was uh, in the store management for Walmart, and uh, one of my jobs once was to go down to the Chicago area and help set up some new stores, and I was actually in Glen Ellen, of all places, and my sister lived, my oldest sister lived in Buffalo Grove, and uh, went down there. They worked you hard, like you worked every day, because the store was behind and you were kind of there to help to fix little problems here and there and stuff. So down there, setting up a new store, it was a brand new store, helping the team from there get it ready. Anyway, my one day off a week, I called my sister. She drove down, picked me up. We went in downtown Chicago to the, a place called Goose Island. Mm-hmm. And Goose Island was in an old warehouse in right near Cabrini Green, kind of a rough part of Chicago at the time. And, um, we went into this warehouse, and I love beer, too. Going back to my college years at St. Norbert, uh, a bunch of my roommates, we would go to the liquor store. Back then, we would buy the uh, import beers, which were usually from Germany and England, right. and we'd have all these unique styles of beer that nobody else had. Because back in, I graduated in 92, craft beer wasn't really out there. You know, Sierra Nevada was out there, and that was about it. And um, Goose Island, too, which they weren't bottling at the time. But um, experienced Goose Island, and I said, you know... I would love to do this in Green Bay, find an old building. They were in an old warehouse and um, bring this back to Green Bay, bring back brewing back to Green Bay, which the last brewery was in 1967, and basically kind of create this concept where it's a restaurant and brewery called the Brew Pub and use Goose Island as kind of my inspiration. And that's what we did. Um, I At the time, my brother-in-law, John, um, he was getting his MBA from um, Northwestern and um, he had to do a class project with starting a business, a business plan. And he's like, can I use your idea? And um, we'll make it into, and we called it Title Town Brewing Company. And uh, and this would have been back in 90, probably 93, um, 94 in that era. And um, basically that his uh, MBA program was the beginning of our business plan. And, you know, I had never started a business, uh, started a business. And uh, but that's where it started with that business plan, and we kind of people. I, I remember going to my my stepdad's. Um, you know, I think it was his fiftieth birthday party, and um, one of the guys is like, you know, I told him like what I was doing. I work for Walmart, but I'd love to do this brewery. And he's like, he goes, before you get any older, and I wish I remember who it was because he kind of put me on the path and stuff. But he said, you should do it now before you get old like me and don't want to take any chances. And I'm I, I went home that night and I'm like, you know. Uh, Walmart was good to me. It was a great company to work for. I don't regret it. But I was like, you know, you had to travel a lot. My wife had a job in Green Bay. Uh, she was my girlfriend at the time. And I like Green Bay. You know, you got to want to live in Green Bay. And I wanted to live here. And my family was here. And um, that's when I decided, like, you know what? I'm going to take the leap and start Title Town Brewing Company. And um, at the time, I drove or I, I went out. I, I joined this group called the uh, Brewers Association. And they had a conference in Portland. So I went out to Portland, Oregon on a red-eye flight last minute. My stepmom was a travel agent. She got me on this flight. I, I, I flew to, like, Las Vegas and then to um, uh, up to Portland, and it was, like, a nightmare flight because it was late, and I don't fly that much, and it was, like, it was just a night. And I show up in Portland with a bag, and, I, you know, I'm not a world traveler by any means, and uh, by myself, and I, I walked to my hotel, stayed in my hotel. It was a little hole in the walls, crazy, terrible. And... Um, went over to the Brewers Conference and just kind of soaked in this trade show, 
seminars on how to start a brewery, and it really got me going at that point. And while I was out there, I met a guy uh, named John Hickamooper. Um, for those of you that don't know, he's now currently the governor of Colorado. And um, I had met this other guy in an elevator and said, uh, hey, we're going to see this guy, John Hickamooper, and he wants to help other breweries start in other cities. And, you know, at the time, I was just a dreamer. I was like, I worked at Walmart for maybe a little over a year. That was about all my experience, and I had no money and just a dream. I, I met him, and he's like, well, I'd be interested in seeing Green Bay. And, and I, I, I think there's one of the first things about being in Green Bay. Like, I think a lot of people think, like, oh, they're an NFL team city, you know. They're huge, I bet you. <laughs> you know, he, uh, or they have the opposite. Ex- you know, they, they hear that it's a small town, and they think it's like we're smaller than we are. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So um, he's like, well, let's stay in touch. And um, so in the meantime, my brother-in-law had to fly through Denver uh, and visited John Hickenlooper. And, and to go back, John Hickenlooper started a brew pub back in 1988, kind of the early years. Kind of, He was one of the pioneers and, um, or the uh, settlers, whatever you want to call them. And, but he um, started the Wincoop Brewing Company in downtown Denver in the Lodo district. It's an old warehouse. Uh, Lo- Lodo means lower downtown. And at that time, Lodo was similar in a different category, but it's similar to Broadway, kind of a rough part of town. Nobody went there. However, you could go down there and, and get buildings, inexpensive, beautiful old warehouses, you know, and he built his brew pub there on, on Wincoop Street. He turned out he was the largest brew pub in the nation at the time, and they were doing like 5,000 barrels, which is a lot of beer. Anyway, my brother flew through and talked to him, and they kind of over a napkin, like, well, let's, I'll, I'll come out to Green Bay, and let's check out the situation, and he came out here and he's like, I'm willing to work with you guys. Let's make something happen. And that was how it started, basically. And, you know, it was one of those being friendly with people and meeting somebody that knew him and connecting with them and probably gave Town that legitimacy that we needed. You know, here the world's largest brew pub was going to be our partner. They were half, they own half of Town. Anyway, that's the deal got consummated. We started it. We were looking at old buildings in downtown Green Bay. The depot was actually not even on our our radar screen, but the depot became available while we were looking, and we're like, wow, that's a great building, you know, uh, everyone who grew up in Green Bay kind of, you're driving downtown, we're like, oh, that would make a great restaurant, you know, it's got the five-story clock tower and just a beautiful old building. When it became available, we're like, well, let's try for that. Well, it didn't happen as fast as we'd want it, so we, but we put our hat in the ring and they, the city chose us. Back then, it was Mayor Hallowen, actually, uh, Rob Strong from the city de- development, and then Mayor Hallowen and stopped running it was Mayor Jaden and stuff. So we had some really, you know, like, you know, going back to Mayor Hallowen, we had some support, you know, that they wanted to see this building saved, and so did we. We were able to save it, and um, 20 years later, we're still in the same spot and also expanding over into the, the Larson warehouses. What year did this stuff put a, yeah. time, put a little bit more of a time? Yeah, sure. So that would be about 90, um, let's say we opened in 96, so late 94, early 95, right around there is when okay. we went. Uh, basically, the city, the railroad was selling it. They were divesting of it. And because of railroad property, it has to be offered to the state, the county, and then the like, local municipality. The city, the state didn't want it. The county didn't want it. But the local municipality, Green Bay, wanted it. And really just to save it. So make sure that it just didn't get torn down. Because it was, it's one of those buildings, you know, it's similar to Lambeau Field. It's very iconic. Matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see Channel 5 News and Channel 26, like our building is in like the background when the news anchors are talking and stuff. It's, it's kind of cool. It's like the courthouse, Lambo, And I can't tell Lambeau. you over at Camera Corner how many people come in with their cameras and that's the first place they go shoot their pictures off. Awesome. awesome. Yep. Yeah. No, yep. No, it's, it's definitely one of those, uh, you know, trains and people like it. And it's unfortunately a lot of people, older folks, um, have great memories of that building. Mm-hmm. Some sad, some happy and stuff. And, Going off to war, you know, uh, going to Chicago for the first time or Milwaukee shopping. And just uh, real life-changing events for a certain, if you're over the age of 50, you probably remember leaving that train station for some kind of, uh, or picking up your aunt or uncle coming up from some faraway place. So it was the airport of yesteryear. It's where you went to travel and leave Green Bay and come back a different person, I'm sure. So kind of take me from those early days a little bit to now. And I guess I'm interested in uh, some of the challenges. That yeah. Well, so, you know, when we opened back in 96, um, 
they kind of announced that the Main Street Bridge pilings were rotting and that they were going to have to shut the bridge down. So basically right after we opened, which they always talk about location, location, location. And, and I can't tell you how many people said, Brent, don't go downtown. You know, it, you know, go out to Ashwaubenon, out into the suburbs and stuff. That's where your market is. The people that want to go to Titletown don't live downtown. They're not going to drink craft beer. You know, again, I think a lot of them had good points and stuff. You know, there's nothing wrong with going out to those areas. But I think part of our, I don't want to call it our mission, but our just our, our ethics and what we, we wanted to be in an old building and be part of what similar Wincoop was into downtown Denver. Because real quick too, uh, downtown Denver where Wincoop is located. Well, now if you stand out on their patio and it's in an old warehouse, but they have a patio alongside of it, you can look to the right and you see um, uh, Coors Field literally a, two blocks away. The new renovated train station is across the street from them. It's now the new all light rail comes in there and then Amtrak comes there. I mean, it is a hot part of town. Everybody wants to live down there. It's called Lodo. It's just an amazing part of downtown Denver. And again, a lot of people credit John Hickenlooper and his group with making things happen in that part of Denver and stuff. Because it takes a couple of those people like I said, he was a pioneer, but he always said the pioneers get the arrows because it's not easy. You know, you're, it, it's it's hard when you're going in there. And I think that's kind of what we did with Broadway, too. Again, I grew up on the west side. I had a little per- different perception of other people. Yeah, it was, a, you know, not the nicest part of town, but it wasn't like downtown Beirut or something like that. It was a uh, little lot of bars, a lot of sometimes unsavory characters walking down the street. But, you know, they're probably nice people. They just dressed a little differently than you. And there, there was a perception, though. And, and, and whether you like it or not, there was that perception. So going to da- you know downtown was definitely a challenge. We just persevered. So the bridge closed down. So we now had one way to get into Titletown, uh, either Museum Way or Dousman. It, it wasn't easy to get to, which is not something you want for a first-year restaurant and stuff. So, so there was definitely some challenges. And you know I think being new helped us maybe a little bit, uh, being a brew pub. We could overcome maybe some of those challenges, but I believe the bridge was out for like two years, like having constant construction, you know, and then big signs that say bridge close and kind of hard to walk, drive around them. And again, we, we made it work. And, you know, now looking back at it, wow, would you not want to be anywhere else but downtown Green Bay? And I think the answer is, you know, we would only want to be in downtown Green Bay. So do you feel that that challenge, did that hurt you a lot? Um, You know, I, I think back when I did it, I... What I know now and what I know back then, I probably wouldn't have gone there, you know, and it was a job. But I think, you know, you're so new and, and that some of those fears don't even come across your mind. But, you know, looking back at it, definitely put ourselves out there and stuff. And again, it was one of those things, nobody knew the bridge was going to be closed down. You know, you couldn't blame the, the mayor at the time, it was Jaden that, that, who shut it down. You know, it just, it was, it was what it was. In retrospect, you think that you mentioned that's your first year. So every business, when they things, they have a plan, but that first year, things change drastically. Yes. So do you think that that maybe was a little bit of an opportunity that it allowed you to maybe be maybe less popular? Um, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't um, remember it never being popular. Yeah, this you know, I mean, <laughs> well, it just it was just a challenge, you know. And, and again, we were kind of the you know the farmers market wasn't going on. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot. Of, I mean. There was only, like, I'd say Bernstein's Candy and Scan Home are the two, and I'm probably going to miss some really nice ones, too. And there was a lot of other, like, nice businesses down there, but not businesses that, like, you know, there was car parts stores and stuff like that. Stores that, like, not everybody went to, but there was no, like, massive retail, like, and I'm, like you see now. And so there wasn't a lot of reason for people to go down there. Convention center was mediocre at best and stuff, and the hotels, there wasn't many hotels and, uh, other than the three big ones there. There was definitely challenges like just that being kind of the first again you know now there's hinterlands down there there's other restaurants that's awesome everyone's like oh are you worried about other restaurants coming out i no i want more restaurants because i i have this bigger kind of vision that the more things are to do the more reasons you are to come down there hey maybe you you know like the meyer theater like wow what a great you know now people come down for shows here and we save that building too you know there's just some great things going on down there It's, it's it's been positive Let's talk about the depot building. Sure. What's your favorite architectural thing or favorite? Yeah. Thing? Well, you know, you got. I, I got to think the clock tower is the coolest part. Which, um, as I was leaving today, I'm like, 
you know, the time changed on Saturday. I got to change the clock. I, uh, uh, and I, as you know, people rely on that. Exactly. Well, three <laughs> sides work. One side is missing a hand and it's been that way for a long time. But uh, you know, the clock tower, I think it's one of those, um, the railroad, you know, when they came to Green Bay, it, it was actually the city of Fort Howard at the time. And it was one of the reasons that Green Bay and Fort Howard merged because Green Bay got Chicago Northwestern, which was a heavy player in railroads at the time. And the railroad meant, you know, commerce and things, things were going to happen in that town. And they put Fort Howard and Green Bay on the map. And now they could send things by train down to Chicago. You could, people could take train. I mean, I don't think we understand how hard it was to like go from Green Bay to Chicago before there were trains. I mean, it was, the roads weren't good. It probably took days to get there and stuff. And your tires, if you had a car, were probably not that good. You know, just the clock tower because... And now, know, and now people come up for the event uh, last last night yeah. and then went back that night to Chicago. Oh, to Chicago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the, now the Chicago's spons- like... The sponsors were from Chicago. Unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's just like, boom, you're, you're back, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, the, just the clock because back... Uh, matter of fact, in the newspaper, they show the this time 50 years ago, 100 years ago, there was one and they had like some like tax thing and how many... Um, how many pocket watches? I don't know if they tax pocket watches, but there was only like a hundred pocket watches back in 1897 or something s- silly like that. And I'm like, well, that's because, you know, the courthouse had a clock. You put clocks on because you didn't go to Walmart and buy a $6 Timex, you know, that you just could, you know, if it broke, it wasn't a big deal. And watches didn't keep good time. So then exactly. you'd, uh, you'd have to have something to set it to anyway. <laughs> right. And, and the railroad, uh, uh, God bless them, they, they set the whole time... Uh, what do you call it, the time periods and stuff like uh, Eastern, Central, and their trains, they had to run on time. So that's my favorite part of the, you know, because it's, it has no use other than it's got a clock in it. I think about how much brick and money they spent just to build a clock tower. It's just one of those beautiful buildings, but it makes it stand out. You see it in a lot of pictures. You can, it was kind of a, a beacon, if you will. So now we have controversy with the whole Walmart thing, sure. and then and then you are now spearheading all the development there. Sure. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. Not to talk too much about the Walmart thing. You know, I work for Walmart, so I, I know there are some people that just think they're the most evil corporation on earth and stuff, and you know what? I, I never felt that way, and I'm always, I think, I, I, I give them a lot of credit for a lot of, like, who I am in terms of a business, you know, like, just coming over here, I park farthest away from the front door because I want my customers to have a better spot. Well, Walmart talk. I probably would have never done that had I not worked for them. It helped me with a, that whole customer-centric outlook in my life and stuff. You know, so I was not against them. I didn't, as someone who likes old buildings, though, I just, you know, I did not want those old buildings torn down. However, at the time, you know, I knew on Broadway was going through major challenges financially and Bird's Eye was moving out and they were going to be left with these buildings. And um, anyway, so I didn't want them to tear the buildings down. However, I... I saw the benefit at Walmart. I live downtown too. I live on the east side, right uh, in the Astor area. You know, frankly, it'd be nice to have some kind of store downtown like that for the residents and stuff. But again, I didn't think it was the right spot. But I never want to tell a business where they can and can't locate. Again, I think everything worked out. The city council denied it, and that's it went through the proper channels. That's what the people wanted. So now we're at the point now where um, those buildings are not going to be torn down. We actually just got under contract with the city um, uh, to develop those. And we're, and again, I, I'm running a brewery and a restaurant. I'm part of it in that I want good things to happen there. So I want something that's going to be good for our project. We don't want like a, a house of ill repute to locate there or something. We're going to we're gonna work on something that's going to be class act. And I think time will tell. And I can't tell you a lot of things right now because just because we're in negotiations with some other companies. But there are some neat ideas and plans for there that... Knock on wood, hopefully. Is there going to be an Apple store? I wish. I don't know. You, you're, you, you, the, the way you said that reminded me of an interview with Steve Jobs. He's like, well, the, and this was uh, before the I, it was between the iPhone and the iPad. He's like, there are a few things that we're working on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always, you know, and I know you and I kind of, uh, and uh, uh, Scott Eastman kind of know the whole Steve Jobs story. And, you know, he's got some kind of Green Bay connections. Uh, I think we're more happy about his Green Bay connections than he probably was and stuff. But, um, you should talk about that. Yeah. I, I, I didn't mean to like uh, cut in in the middle. No, well, and I just, just real quick on the, 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 the location. So, you know, that, spite, uh, that site is challenging too. It's got some big overhead power lines going through there. Uh, it's got some contamination in the soil. And but um, the warehouses are in really good shape that are there. They're, compared to the ones we renovated, which were 
water was coming through them and, and still two of them that we're working on right now, you know, they were just in bad shape. These are in good shape. So they're the, the, the bone and the bones are good in all those buildings. I bet you if nobody did anything with them and you let them just sit for, a, I bet you they'd be standing in 500 years. They're just so well built and stuff. So, but anyway, um, so I think you'll see some great things happening there. And again, uh, something to enhance those neighborhoods over there and also um, kind of enhance the whole downtown experience. Sponsor break. Sure. And I'd like your views on the studio. And then when we come back, I want to hear you tell the Steve Jobs story. Awesome. Give me your first impressions when you walk in here. Oh, this is cool. I actually, I remember coming in here when it was a print shop. And so I used to come and we used to, before we had a copier, and you know, you just did everything at print shops. You'd come here all the time and get stuff printed. And then there was a bookstore here. I don't know if you remember that. It was like here for maybe two years, my life. But the guy specialized in military history books, like old books. It was the coolest book shop. <laughs> it's a shame to see it go. He was a retired postal employee, and um, I can't. I feel terrible. I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, so it's neat to be back in here, and this is really neat. I didn't realize we had this here, and uh, I know you're affiliated. It's affiliated with Camera Corner, correct? It's Camera Corner Studios. It's Camera Corner Studios, and you know what? Camera Corner. They do everything right. So Well, they're another iconic business. They are. Right? Yep. Uh, we had Z-Man in here, and Nick is going to help put together, put a video together for Z-Man's performance that he had in here before. So there's a, he's got a black screen over there. He's got cameras all over the place. He had a handheld that he was going around with. It's mostly soundproof. The only exception seems to be when we have the windiest day of the year. Exactly. Today. <laughs> uh, because honestly, we've had uh, you know emergency vehicles sure. go by, and yep. I couldn't hear anything. This looks like a well built building too. So anyway, anything I missed there, Nick? Well, I mean, we're we're just we're here as a, a resource. You know, whether we're looking for someone maybe that makes YouTube videos at home or podcasts that wants to take their production up a notch, or small businesses that aren't quite ready to jump in full fledged with a huge marketing campaign and a huge marketing budget, we're an affordable option for that middle ground. So, you know, people that want to start a podcast like this, you know, I don't even have my pricing packages with me, but I think it's like $200 for, an, for a session. Or um, I have people coming in all the time. They'll write three, four small scripts to make TV commercials or radio spots. And for a couple hundred bucks, I can pop up a green screen and a camera and, uh, you know, have fast, easy to use access. Do you know how there's that book on yeah. guerrilla marketing? Yeah, yeah. I feel like Nick is the guerrilla producer. Sure. Uh, guerrilla G-U, not yep. G-O. Yep. Right? Mark Levinson? See, yeah. this is why yeah. he's the president of the Bay and I'm not. <laughs> We've had several po political people in here, mm -hmm. and to me, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if any of them have taken you up on it, but they could come in here for a couple hundred bucks. And you know what? It costs sure. a lot of money, even if yep. you're running for a local office. Yep. Thousands of dollars, yep. that signs. I've done it. <laughs> they could uh, <laughs> they could produce a video for a few hundred bucks, 500 right. bucks in and out. It's going to look professional. It's going to sure. be amazing. And to me, to me, that seems like a much better investment than buying a bunch of yard signs. Or at least split the difference and have half yeah. your budget into it, I, right? I question yard signs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, how do they get in touch with you, Nick? And uh, the any easiest other way is to call us. You know, we've got the rental event and studio production department. Uh, you can reach us at 920-272-0148. I don't say this enough, but I would not be able to do this without Nick. That's the biggest endorsement I can get. Yeah, no, this is impressive. I can't live my life without Title Town Beer, and I can't, I can't <laughs> live my podcast life without, without Nick. <laughs> Hey, do you actually know how to make a podcast? And I said, you know, sort of. Sure. Thank you, Nick. I can't. Thank I can't you thank you enough. I'm just. I'm glad to be able to support the show because I think that you know the guests you have and the conversations you have are amazing things that if more people knew about, I don't think Green Bay would get as much smack talk as it does for being a small city. Yeah, I got I, a lot of friends that talk about moving to a bigger city. It's plenty big if you listen to the right people and go to the right places. Yep. Speaking of the president of Green Bay, sure. Tell, tell your story about, about Steve Jobs. Yeah, you know, I, I, and I, I think I'm pretty accurate on the whole thing, and, and I, I probably don't know all of it. I believe it was Scott Eastman a long time ago. There was an article in the paper that said um, Green Bay's Apple Store, and, and we actually do have an Apple Store here, and they sell apples, the kind you eat. <laughs> and uh, it's been around forever. It's actually, um, I kind of looked into that. It's, um, it was put together by a bunch of apple farmers up in Door County, was there a way of bringing apples from the Door County market to the big city of Green Bay to all, sell all the way to Green Bay? Exactly, exactly, <laughs> and um, and and sell apples to the community. I my I went there as a young kid and stuff. I remember my dad going there and 
we get apples, and I know they they'd sell apples for like deer stand, you know, the, the apples that fell on the ground and stuff. They'd have bags of those outside, and then you could also get like apple cider. And they had, matter of fact, they had those like those milk machines that you had like in, with that big silver thing that you pick up, and and they had those with apple juice, and you could have as much as you wanted to drink and everything. Anyway, I remember Scott had something on about Steve Jobs' connection to Green Bay, and I. I was like, you're kidding me. And at the time, I love Apple products. And, or just, you know, who doesn't like the whole Apple story and stuff? And I, I just watched that uh, Michael Fassbender movie uh, with my wife a couple weekends ago. That's- Excellent acting, but I felt like it should have been different. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a little, it, but it was, you know, it just kind of, you know, I know they kept referring to like his mother giving him up. And I kept thinking back to Mona Simpson back in Green Bay having Steve and giving him up for adoption, you know, even though they were married because they weren't ready to take care of a kid and then have another kid later that was Steve's biological sister, uh, Mona, or um, actually Mona. Mona is the sister. Mona is the sister. I'm sorry. And no. um, uh, jo- uh, jo- your story. I hate to Joanne. <laughs> Joanne is the mom. Jo- jo- uh, and it's funny, my next door neighbor who just passed away, Rosemary Hinkless, wonderful lady. She knew Steve's biological mother. And she said she was one of those women when she walked in the room she was so beautiful, just everybody would turn her, their head. So, you know, I've never seen a picture of Steve Jobs' mother, but um, apparently she was a, a, a beautiful woman. She grew up on the east side, and, and I know my sister, ironically, one of her friends gave her a book uh, by Mona Simpson. I forget the title of it, Letters from Somewhere. But she remembered it was, it was about Green Bay, and that's why her friend gave it to her. It's like this woman wrote a story about it visiting Green Bay and her parents and she talks about coming into our train station and going to visit the parents and they lived actually and not to get Walmart back in where the east side Walmart is that's where they that's where the jobs or well the uh, uh, Steve Jobs biological families lived in Green Bay right out there and um but she had this certain smell of the house her grandparents house and everything but anyway she grew up then on the uh, the west side ironically with one of our, our employees Kat who's our day bartender Cat was next door neighbors to Mona Simpson and Joanne Joanna Simpson. Anyway, they were a very really fun couple. She remembers that Steve's sister had a pet raccoon. That's how she remembers of her and stuff. A, a neat little story about why you know um, this boy who was born given up for adoption. They kind of came from this family that just seemed to be go getters. Like the daughter did well, and the parents were really smart too, and and kind of revolutionized. I, I'm looking around right now. You've got a Mac. Computer, wow. we both got Mac phones, you know, or Apple phones. So I'm kind of an Apple addict. Yeah. Uh, I've watched every documentary. <laughs> I've watched every Steve Jobs YouTube video. Sure. I, I have a sickness. Sure. Yeah. So you, you, you were talking about the beginning of Title Town, and you said somebody was at, uh, you were telling the story of the party, 50th birthday party or something. Yep. So somebody about our age now uh, was saying, get into business while Actually, you're Actually, he was a little older than that. He, he was older, yeah. I, you know, because he said he'd wish he'd done things that. Okay. Fine. Okay. So I'll postpone this question another sure. ten years. No. So, uh, but what I'm getting at is, uh, what advice would you give to somebody that was starting out? You know, there's somebody they're 20, 25 years old. They're like young and naive, like sure. we were. Yep. Yep. Which is good sometimes. So, um, you know, I, I, which I always say to my staff right now is like, uh, if it was easy, everyone would do it. You know, um, it's not going to be easy. You know, opening a business has loads of challenges and some that like you don't even realize you know like um uh, you know when i hear all the politicians talking and anyway i just feel sometimes business whether it's even big business or small business there are cha- we should be like trying to encourage business and yet as a society sometimes we just we make it so hard to start a business and and again i don't mean to I'm probably gonna upset some people by saying that but uh I, I think um, you honestly, uh-huh. you you really think that that would it would upset people to hear that well, this, uh, that our country, our city, should embrace business. Small yeah, well, business? yeah, you know, sometimes I do. Sometimes I think it's like all of a sudden it's like they're we're just piggy banks to just suck from the trough from, and I just you know some some days there's like you know there's some new license for this or something new. Well, you that, did you, know. you did pull up in your in your brand new Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 my other one did start, so I, you know, I, it was so cold the batteries, right. you know, but right. but I just no, I'm just kidding. I don't have a Tesla, right? Okay. <laughs> no, for the record, I think everybody knows Brent doesn't have a Tesla. Yeah, yeah, and um, well, it's funny, you know, when I was first starting out, I joked about my car that you had to, I had to see your tetanus shots because 
you know, it had a lot of rust on it. So, you know, and again, I, you know, I, I, I've never been on high on cars. Like I don't like, I don't really care what I drive. I just, as long as it gets me from A to B, would I like to drive a BMW? Cause it's the same as my initials. Sure. But I'm just happy with my Ford right now. So, which is a total car that I got <laughs> for a good price. So yeah, you know, I, I you know, I would just say, obviously you want to uh, be passionate about what you do. You got to want to do it and be ready for a lot of challenges and stuff. And you know, the big thing, always go into something a little more well capitalized, you know, especially the restaurant business. You don't want to go in and all of a sudden, you know, you don't have enough money the next year or something, you know, your first year, you just be ready for the worst, you know, and stuff. So, um, but it's fun, you know, if there's a certain independence to it, a great, I'm glad I did it. You know, like I said earlier, I think what, what I know now, what I know when I was starting it are different. So would I do it now? Probably not just because I, I have a family and people I have to provide for. I wouldn't go out so far that like if I things went bad, I'd have to like restart. And I don't want to restart. You know, I'm in my mid forties right now, and I don't want to restart over. So um, I wouldn't be as do something as big as I did and stuff. Because what we did was big. I would I would do something smaller, something that you know if it failed, it won't destroy you. I think that that is super sound advice. So the uh, the the number one mistake that we made uh, being in business and. We were naive and we didn't we didn't realize it, but uh, we were completely undercapitalized. Yeah. I think we probably never fully recovered from that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, especially being in the type of business we were in, banks looked at you like you were. I think they would be more apt to give money to adult entertainment, <laughs> sure. uh, you know, for lack of a better term. They're just like, no, we don't. I don't even really know. I don't even understand the words you're using yep. Yep. back in those days, right? The capitalization thing, uh, yeah. I think, is something that entrepreneurs really undervalue. Yeah. No, you're right. Every and uh, so Z Man was here just a little bit ago, and uh, so he was. Uh, you know, I asked him a very similar question. I think that that would be something that we would all say. All entrepreneurs would say, "Boy, you have to love it because on the good days, that's going to be amazing, and nothing's yep. a better high than that. Yep. But on the low days, boy, if you didn't have that, no, yeah. you, you would quit. Yep, you would quit a hundred times over, right?" The passion thing, I don't think it can be said enough, but I think that that is something that successful people, I think, all have to share. Yep. One thing that I said to Z-Man was, uh, I heard just recently that Warren Buffett was asked a similar question, mm -hmm. and he said, okay, make a list of the 25 things you like doing the best, and then throw out the bottom 20, because you will never be able to make a business out of those. Right. I think that those are the, the types of... That's just a nugget that I'm never going to forget now that I, you know, when I, when I heard that. So what would be another, what would be a thing like that? What, what's one of those thousands of people are going to listen to this. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you. Sure. And they all want to know what is the Brent Weicker secret formula for success. I, I think a lot of it is like, you got to have a real supportive family. Like my wife is awesome. I, I always remember back when we first started it and, you know, I had a job and I quit my job and we weren't married yet. And then I was getting married and, and I'm like, I'm like, your father must just love me. <laughs> Hi, I'm going to marry your daughter. By the way, I have no job. <laughs> you know, I, I want to start a brewery. You got to have the people that are around you supportive because you're going to have a lot of challenges. So you want people positive. And from my wife right to my parents, I, both my parents are divorced, and but they both, uh, you know, if you're uh, John Hickenlooper said, you know, when he asked his mom to invest in his brewery and she said no and he had to convince her, but that was, a, you know, you knew when his mom finally convinced his mom to invest in his brewery that, you know, he was on the right track and stuff. And, you know, my parents both helped, you know, we're, they're still owners to this day. I unfortunately lost my stepfather last year, but, um, you know, they were part of it. And, they, and it's, just, it's good having that support network because, you know, I can't tell you how many times, you know, whether it's trip advisor, you know, you just, you always get beat up and it's like, so you need some positiveness and you're like, try to always find that because like you said, it, it there's a lot of things that'll get you down every day, and, and I catch myself sometimes letting myself get too down. Like you know, I, I take criticism a little too tough, and maybe it's a good thing too because restaurants, you know, like everyone has their own issue of what service, good service is, and stuff. And you have a lot of a lot of my staff members are young, and sometimes they want to get out of there at the end of the night. They don't treat my guests as good as I would like them to be treated, and 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 again, does it happen all the time? No, it happens sometimes, sure. You know, my thing is just have that real good support network around you that's positive and they're your best advocates. They're the ones that are going to pick you up when you're down and stuff. And that's that's definitely my wife and my, my close family and stuff. I don't know if it's just because I'm there and I feel like you treat me special, but I, 
I, I don't think it is. I think that everybody that goes into into Title Tone feels like they're treated special, yep. which is not normal. No, and I, you know, I I, th- I think that goes back to being an independent. Not that not that other restaurants can't do it. And, you know, that's why I always tell my staff too. Like everyone can make food, even everyone can open up a brewery, um, and and we try to do the best food and the best beer that we can do. And we're, it all comes down to people and like how you treat people. I'm by nature a gregarious person, like I, and I, I think I get it from my parents. Both of my parents are just sweet people. My dad, I, I kind of joke, I, I hate going to Fleet Farm with them because we can never get out of there. Like we just we go in to pick up one thing, and you know he's a retired Green Bay fireman and he's got a trucking company. But we'd stop and see people, and my dad tell a story. Well, people love hearing my dad's stories. My dad's got jokes. You know, he's like, my dad's just this gregarious guy. And then same with my mom. My mom's just like this sweet lady, like can't harm a fly, basically. And, and, I, and I think I get it from them. And going back to when my grandma had a restaurant, too, my grandma knew a lot of people. Same with my Uncle Barney. But they're just like good people. And I think people like going into places that, I don't know everybody's name, but I like acknowledge people. And again, as we've gotten bigger, it's becoming more challenging to, that I, I don't stay there as late as I used to. First of all, I I'm getting old and it's hard to stay up past nine o'clock. I, I like, I'm like, just I'm exhausted. But you know, I wake up really early, but I just mm-hmm. go to bed early too. Just making people feel special. And it, it's got to be genuine too, because anyone can have a little thing that says, Welcome to Title Town. How are you? You want to be genuine. And yeah. uh, we try to do that. And we've we recently just won that USA Today best brew pub in the nation. And it was a, yeah, it was a little, I, I think I saw you at the party actually. <laughs> um, you know, and again, it was a popularity contest, but. Obviously, we had people out there that were voting. We were up against some pretty impressive brew pubs, not to mention in cities way bigger than Green Bay. So that says something, and I think we have a real good fan base out there. We're always working on it. We can always be better at it, but you know, we have just a good group of people, and we try to make people feel welcome. It's called hospitality. I have this uh, reputation that you know people can take me. <laughs> either, either way, usually they. I know I've had to defend you many times. <laughs> Tell me about one of these stories, <laughs> Mr. Storyteller. <laughs> I just want to share my opinion on the thing that you were talking about being a little bit controversial. And that is that in our country, we make it difficult for businesses. In my relatively short stint over uh, on that side of the river mm-hmm. and on Broadway, that was really what I wanted. I want, I, and I still want that out of that area, out of your area. Now. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, I want that to be our entrepreneur corridor. I want that to be our, I don't, I don't want it to be an incubator so much because sure. I don't want them to like grow up and leave. I want them to grow and stay there and build more of an ecosystem. Right. You know, maybe we run out of room on Broadway because there's so many excellent right. entrepreneurs. That would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Right. I feel like I tried to say to you, I don't think anybody would argue with that, but yet with their words, but I feel like the actions didn't really line up with what it takes to make that happen. Right. From talking about what we should spend our limited budget on to the events to, you know, the actions, everything I look at, like you would, through a lens of how will this make our businesses stronger? How will this make our businesses better? How will this attract new entrepreneurs to our area? Sure. That was everything that I wanted to do. Just the other day from now when we're recording, there was something in the press gazette about the three downtown districts merging. Oh, sure. And I guess I just want your brief thoughts on that. Yeah. I haven't been following it that much. Someone actually, my sister called me about it the other day and I had heard rumblings about it. And I know kind of Maine and EGBI are kind of the same entity and stuff. And, and I see, I see some advantages to having like the same thing, but I do think Broadway is kind of a little, has its own little identity over there. I think they should work in close conjunction with the east side of Green Bay because ultimately they're really, I consider what happens on that east side just as important what happens right near me on the Broadway side. But I do think like the east side kind of has, as I'm looking out my windows at Titletown, but all the big banks are over there, convention center, and then we're kind of this little kind of cool little... Entrepreneur corridor. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got a lot more smaller, older buildings. We've kind of kept that intact and in core is there a way like could they share a fax machine or so you know i, I don't know I, I i would probably if i was the vote had a vote on it i would say not to merge them other than can we just can they work together and i think they kind of do a little bit you know it obviously can get better and stuff 
you don't want to be planning a, an event where DG guys doing the same event and the same, but you know, stuff like that. Like, but I do think it's got to have its own identity. It's essential. I think it's crucial. And actually, in order to be a Main Street district, there's very few efficiencies that they can even have. Right, right. And I think that would be the biggest argument not to merge because we do have that Main Street designation, which the others don't. And my knowledge of that is like we kind of have resources that we already have. So, but again, I think all three directors, or if there is a director for the one, need to have like lunch every week. Yeah, you know, and they were doing that. Yeah, uh, and I think they still C- are. So City Hall had initiated yep. that. Yeah, because uh, my sister is actually uh, in charge of the absolutely. Military Avenue District. She goes to that meeting as well. And again, there's kind of an upstart new one. Probably not as exciting as these ones downtown. You know, military's definitely got a whole different vibe than their um, West Side District as well. So yeah. I feel like that would be a, they would be kind of cut out of the club then. Yep. I mean, there again, there's another reason right. because we and university will probably have one too. Yep. So I feel like there is an it's sort of important to focus. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm a Green Bay guy, and I, and I know that one of the criticisms I get to is, like, you know, well, everything's downtown and stuff. And it's like, well, first of all, we've neglected the, well, we, I should say we've neglected the downtown, but the downtown's gone through some challenges. There's just a lot of land down here the city owns, so that's why the city's been putting a lot of effort into it. I grew up on the west side of Belp Avenue, they fixed that up nice. Monroe, they just fixed up nice. I want all good things to happen to Green Bay. We're, I, I always see Green Bay as that we're one of those cities, we're not a Milwaukee, I went to West, Green Bay West, you know, those inner city schools are going to start having some challenges. I have a son that goes to East. It's not like Green Bay East and West when I was young. You know, there's just, there's different, kids aren't as involved in things as they were when I was there. So those schools have some challenges and stuff. And I think it's important that we don't turn into a Detroit or a Milwaukee. And it could very well happen and stuff. And that's, so anyway, I just, so what happens in the Military Avenue Corridor, University, it's good. It's all good for, you know, we want good. I, I don't want them to only focus on Broadway, and I don't think they do. I think the city, you know, I think they get bashed a little unfairly and stuff. I think um, balancing the whole city out and stuff. But there's definitely a lot of opportunity downtown, and I probably subscribe to that uh, method that the Apple core, you know, if there's a rotten core, you know, you can put, you know, a lipstick on pig. It's still a pig. You know, it's we want our downtown to look pretty and nice because... That's what people's perception of Green Bay is going to be like because it's got the river running through it. And, and I think lately it looks wonderful downtown and it's only going in the right direction. Yeah, I think the improvements are awesome. I want to thank my other sponsor sure. that I always call out to, and that is Release Wire. And I happen to be starting up a new podcast also. And that one's called Green Bay Newsmakers. And that's going to be focused on entrepreneurs. Okay. I know you know millions of them. Sure. Maybe literally millions. Well, I'd like to know more, actually. They are located in the Broadway District. Release wire off of Walnut and uh, right right before the bridge. Oh, okay. The Uh, old... um, ICS building. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That used to be a uh, Studebaker. See, you know too much. Yeah. Release wire, they do press release services. So let's say I wanted to send out a press release. What should I do? And he had some really great explanations for that. He said that on your website, your blog should be your public releases that you give out to people on the street, and you should put out press releases as your blog to specifically to journalists. That's a really nice way to think about it, and they have a package for thirty nine ninety nine, which I think is pretty awesome. So if you're going to send out a press release, they will send it out targeted to the publications that meet your oh. demographics. Yeah, so not just a... If you were going to send out a press release or if I was going to send it out, I'd be like, well, I'll send it out to all the Green Bay media, right? Well, you know, you might want to send it out to publications all over the place in Portland and Denver, sure. wherever, that talk about beer because sure. they might pick it up. Right? right, right, right. So they help with that stuff. Sure. And it's really good. And uh, so, yeah, and I'm excited to have a little podcast with oh, them. Neat. Okay. So you can go to releasewire.com and, and send out press releases and you can actually set up a free business profile there for you can subscribe to things. It's sort of mind-numbing, but there's more information on releasewire.com. Now I just want to do fun stuff. Sure. What is your favorite, uh, what's your favorite entree on the title town menu? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I, I become one of these creatures that we have an elk burger on there that is just like, I don't know why, it's, just, it's got jalapenos and we get our elk from Navarino elk farms right outside of the city. I don't know, I just love it. It's, just, it's on this rosemary herb bread that we make in our bakery. And it's got a little mayonnaise. Um, the mayonnaise is right off the top of my head here. But anyway, it's just a wonderful sandwich. And I sometimes get it with onion rings. And it's just, I don't know, I love it. The elk burger with onion yeah, rings. Yeah, and then I'd say my nice. second favorite is our fish and chips. It's just, 
I love fish and chips. Been on our menu since day one. And actually, other than a hamburger, hamburger is still our best seller. And, and the elk burger is up there too. So everything that's the number one seller. So I'll just put them all in one of our, our burgers. And then the two and three seller are small fish and chips and large fish and chips. So and that has not changed since 1996. But you didn't have burgers on the menu initially, though, right? No, we did just for lunch. We used to have two oh, different menus. Okay. okay yeah. Okay. Well, we actually had it on the night menu, but we were mad because everyone kept ordering burgers. And that's when, okay, I, that's when, what I, that was. when I finally like got more power in my own company, I said, I go, you know what? If that's what people want, let's give it to them. So, I remember you saying yeah, that. Yeah. You know, and it's just yeah. like, it was one of those goofy things. They like, order oh, it anyway. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like, okay, we're going to make it for them anyway. And if people want that, and that's when we started actually, cause we kind of had like at night a little bit more, I don't want to say a high end menu cause we've never been really fancy schmancy kind of place. We had a lot more pastas and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know what? Let's be more of a pub play. We're looking at what our best sellers were and we were, were pulling, you know, like pulling them off the menu for night. So people want to order them, but yet they'd still ask and we'd make it for them anyway. So, why don't we just give the people what they want? And that's why we still have fish and chips and burgers on the menu. So burgers so great. Please don't lose the pretzel. That is a wonderful pretzel. Well, wow. and, and don't lose the brat plate. The brat plate. Okay, Those. that one's been not a good seller, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's actually our worst seller. I that's unfortunate because it's yeah. amazing. I know, and everyone's like always wants a brat. And then I don't like, know where else you can go for Belgian trip. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Right. I mean, you put trip in the in the wrap. I, I'm sorry. I was there this weekend with my parents, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, about that. You have to try an entree and yes. two apps. You can that's, tell he's from Luxembourg. So, yeah. is poutine still on the menu? It is. Oh yeah. That's our. Yeah. Don't take that off. After cheese curds, that's our second best sell. Cheese curds. We go through so many cheese curds. It's crazy. Can you put a number on that? Like how many? We yeah. Sell? You know, I, I just don't know off the top of my head. It's like it's, like it's not even close. Like like poutine is a lot. I, I want to say like um over. Like 600 orders, and that's like a like it's our new menu, so it's only so, been on like a month. So I know it's a lot. So the next yeah. time we talk, we have, you have that in mind. Well, okay, I will. How yeah. many pounds and how? Oh, and, I see. yep, I got. Or you. how many Lambo fields could be filled up? Exactly. Okay, yep. yep, <laughs> yep <laughs> well, it's definitely. so funny too because my sister in law moved to Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and we went to visit her, and we went to a restaurant called Senate. They they do like gourmet hot dogs. Oh, sure. And they had poutine on the menu that listed cheese curds. And here's this Wisconsin girl who moved to Cincinnati. She's like, I want a cheese curd, right? So we order it, and it comes, and they're all melted because they don't fry their curds. Oh. And she was pissed. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. that, so that's what poutine is. They actually put the curds on the fries, yeah. and then they put this gravy on it. It's a Canadian dish, and, and there's all different. Like, we had some someone that was mad. They didn't like the way. This, this isn't the way poutine. But if you go look at, there's different poutines. Yeah. Sure. People put meat on it and stuff. Yeah. But it's a, it's our little take on poutine. No, it's it's amazing. A, yeah, it's a wonderful dish. So now, favorite beer. Favorite beer. I, um, we first opened, it was Johnny Blood. I just always like, it's my mom's favorite beer. But I started getting into our IPA, our Green 19. We use a hop in it called Citra. And it is just wonderful. However, lately I've been doing the Pilsner, <laughs> and we yeah. and I'm not just saying this because these are the three we bottle, but the Pilsner are just. I was going to say those yeah. are the three popular. Yeah, they ones. are. But the the reason we <laughs> pop, uh, bottle them is because they're our best sellers. Now the the Pilsner was we won a gold medal with at the Great American Beer Fest. It's Boathouse Pilsner. Great little story. Dave, our head brewer, was in the town of uh, Pilsen, Czech Republic. He stayed at the Boathouse um, hostel there. And that's where he had his I first had, Pilsner. I did not realize that. Yeah, so that's why it's called Boat That's House. fantastic. Anyway, wonderful Pilsner. So I'm kind of I kind of into those hoppy light beers right now. But definitely the Green 19, I just... And when it's fresh, it is just... Do you have a preference, like summer or winter? Um, you know what? Does I'm kind of a year-round Green 19. My wife loves IPAs, too. And, and actually, my mom, who likes Johnny Bud's kind of like... She even told me this the other day. She's like, I think I might be liking IPAs more and more. And, uh, you know, again, it's one of those acquired tastes. And, and I, that, that's the other fun thing from when we opened back in 1996. Our best-selling beer was our 400 Honey Ale, which is still a great seller, probably like number four on our list. It is now Green 19, and Johnny Blood is up there too, but Green 19, like, we make it and we sell it as fast as we can make it. I mean, it, and that's why, it, and it's awesome because IPAs tend to not, like, you want to drink them faster because they're really good when they're fresh and stuff. And, and they stay fresh a long time, but... When they're first made, uh, be, you know, beer's got a born on date, and you want to, you don't want to leave it for years or anything. What about when there's aged beers? What's the deal with that? Yeah, so um, those are going to be like in the bourbon barrels yeah. and stuff like that. Those are going to be higher alcohol, yeah. and they can be aged. So there are some exceptions to the rule and stuff. Okay. Matter of fact, um, 
I know our trade organization is going to come up with a little stamp you can put on your bottle that says, this beer is good for cellaring. Because a lot of people are saving beers that they shouldn't save. You know, it, it, it's funny because, you know, the last brewery closed down in 1967. Not a year doesn't go by since we've opened that someone doesn't bring in a six-pack of Rars beer, which was the last brewery, Rars Brewing, right here on Main Street, and uh, say, hey, I, we found this in my grandpa's basement, and it's probably still good. And I'm like, oh, no, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so beer does not get better with age, but those high alcohol... Um, so those are usually my favorites. The ex- well, that are, exactly. That are yeah. bourbon barrels. Yes. Not, and not because of higher alcohol. Yeah. I'm not, I don't <laughs> know. They're a very good sipping beer. They got a wonderful, a lot of that raisin kind of yeah. smell. Yeah. And I love IPAs, but, you know, it was interesting. I was, like, touring the breweries in the Quad Cities. Yes. And they were all about stouts. Oh, okay, like one, sure. I, and I, sh- I, I wish I, could, I had a memory like you do, but one of the downtown breweries there, they had, like, Eight or nine okay. kinds of stouts. On Did menu. you go recently to Minnesota? This was just, it was just last year, I think. Okay. Last summer. Yeah. Oh, the summer, too. Well, it was like right around this time. Okay. Yeah, because, so, like, you know, Easter time. We went down there for Easter. That's, that's what okay. it was, yeah. You know, beer has a seasonality to it, so it's a lot of darker beers in the winter months. You start seeing the lighter ones come out in the summer months and stuff. So there's still box right now, a little heavier still. This is like the Easter time. Bach is a very. Well, it's weird. Beer. But the people in the Quad Cities, they were acting like IPAs were kind of over. Yeah. That, so it's weird how... Yeah, I, I think you're going to see Pilsners change. are coming as like a hot style now, too. Yeah. Because the IPAs are definitely... I like them, but they're definitely on the coast. They're starting to go away from IPAs. Now. And that's where really California, and it was... Everyone was trying to out-hop everyone else, you know, 60-minute IPA, 90-minute IPA, you know, as much hops as you could throw in some of those. And I think a lot of people are just kind of sick of that. A little too much on the taste buds. So now, Lambeau Field is number one. Yeah, Tidal Town Brewing Company is number two. You're the. I, I just say that because you 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 say it all the time. So. <laughs> it is established. Sure. This is fact now. Especially, oh my God, with the new tap room. Oh my God. Yeah, the tap is, is great. There is no question. You can't deny it now. It is the number <laughs> two. I know you tried to deny it. But sure. There's no denying it. So what's number three? Oh my. So if when you have people from out of town. Yeah. You know, they go take their picture in front of mm-hmm. the statues at, at, yep. at Lambeau Field, and then they and then they come to lunch at Tidal Town and have beer, and then what? You know, I, I send a lot of people now, and this wasn't always this way to Bay Beach, yeah, because they have the Zip and Pippin now, and I think that Zip and Pippin is just kind of cool to go see this old wooden roller coaster. That's probably even if they don't have kids and stuff, because I'll tell them the rides are more. Like it's a buck. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, and again, I asked them, "Do you like roller coasters?" Sure. Otherwise, um, uh, I encourage them to take that Packer historical tour. I'm just trying to think if there's like one spot. I, so, uh, what would be the what's what's your next favorite restaurant? You know, what? I like um, Ash. <laughs> I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Well, we you, 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 you could you could throw out a couple. Of them. Yeah, well, and Whatever. you know, I, I live downtown, so yeah. like when I'm on Fridays, like when I'm done at Tidal Town, we'll go to St. Brendan's for fish. My wife and I like fish and chips. Like yeah, I go again. Frank and Pat's Pizza, wonderful place. Yeah. The buffet during the weekday is like, when I go with my brother, they lose money. And my brother just he loves that place. And yeah, that little salad bar. I love that little salad bar. So, too. two great places. What you might not know is all four of my brothers worked at Frank Pants. Really? Yeah. Well, and actually. Um, so, I felt like that was our family restaurant. Sure, yeah. No, and uh, <laughs> well, Pat, one of the grandsons, worked for us too. He lives in Australia now, but um, uh, great story. And then the old owner, um, he passed away, unfortunately, cancer. His daughter comes in every Monday. Uh, just our great family and stuff, and they make wonderful pizza. It's that kind of old thin style, Green yeah. Bay style, that, with yeah. those fresh mushrooms. Right? Oh. Mounds of them. I love them. Yeah, I do too. I, we should go there right now. I, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go. You want to go? I might. Okay. So yeah. I know. I know. I kept you too long. No, no, it's Don't look at No, I just like. Now, favorite non title town beer? Favorite non title These town are the beer. questions the people want to know. Yeah, exactly. I know it's a good question. Bell's Two Hearted Ale was like one of my That's favorite. It is. It's wonderful. Like I always say, it gives you the greatest perps. Like you just like you That's burp up the hops. Yeah. <laughs> um, otherwise, you know, Sierra Nevada has always been like a, a, a big favorite uh, of mine. New Glarus, um, the cherry beer, the Belgian red. Awesome. I know I'm, I'm part Belgian, so maybe that's part of the reason and stuff. That's just a wonderful beer too. And those are the ones that I have in my refrigerator. So I do every so often buy a cheap beer. And I make micheladas. They're like a Mexican, sure. with kind of it's like a salty beer, salty mm-hmm. limey beer. 
And you just gotta buy a like a Miller, or a Budweiser, and just mix it in with. I forget my, my my brother does something like that, and yeah, he has. He's like, I can get so many of these for five dollars or whatever. He gets the cheapest, most horrible yeah, beer. Yep. But yeah, he makes yep. them like that. No, and you know, I, everyone always thinks like you know, like uh, you don't. I don't rip on all the major beers and stuff, and because they make a beer like uh, you know, it's kind of like ripping on McDonald's food. You you know what you're gonna get every time. You know, yes. they they make a consistent product. Budweiser's got a brewery in St. Louis. They got one in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, the beers taste the same. They have this consistency that, and they're, you know, frankly, are good companies and stuff. But we brew pubs start to offer these other uh, flavors that the big guys just don't mess with. I never, I, I remember when I was out at Wincoop training, I was with one of the brewers and he started drinking a Budweiser in front of me. And I was like, I go, you like Budweiser? He's like, you know what? Can't knock these beers. Every so often it's good to just have a Budweiser. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. So, any closing thoughts, and then I just have one closing question after that. Yeah, no, this is neat. I um, I've been seeing you doing these interviews, and like I said, I unfortunately haven't been listening to them, so I'll get on that. Well, well I, I do a lot of podcasts, and I got I have to start being like, unfortunately, I got to listen to them late at night, like when you know, because like some wonderful ones out there and stuff. I have some I should write. Favorite? Pa- what's your favorite podcast? Clark Howard. He's one of the best. Clark Howard is uh, he's like a financial. Kind of a, a sure. consumer advocate. Awesome. Like I learned more from Clark Howard than I did in all my high school years of you know consumer ed and stuff. And I'm, there's one here, and I just have to. I don't listen to it as much as I should. Um, the stuff you miss in history class. Oh, uh, I love that. It's a great one. Yeah, those are good. Um, and then um, the pop culture happy hour. I gotta start listening to that one more because I'll hear about movie stars and I have no idea who they are. And just like it's just good to kind of keep up with current events. So I'm not one of those. You know, old guys as you know everything. And then I'm in that business right. where I deal with my, a lot right. of my staff is young. And then WTF with Mark Marin. Love that. Awesome. Like, you yeah, know, the dead Mark letter, Marin. you know. Actually, my bad. The 99% invisible. Too. Also love 99% Wonderful. invisible. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, like, where does a letter go when it doesn't get delivered? Yeah. yeah. There's a place for that, you know. So if you didn't already listen to that, that would be one I would yep. totally recommend. And then yeah. two other ones real quick. Freakonomics. Love that, too. And then this one, this is kind of a bizarre one. Handle on the law. Oh, I don't know that he's one. He's out of Los Angeles, and he's this lawyer. And he, he sounds like the Better Call Saul lawyer. Nice. Actually, I thought it was him when I, I started really? watching um, the Better Call Saul. What, what was the show before that, Better Call Breaking Saul? Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, oh, my God. And uh, I thought it was him. I'm <laughs> the like, greatest show that's, of all time. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, he, he's like, he, he says he gives you uh, terrible legal advice, and he tells you that you have no case. And it's just, it's so funny. He's like, nice. people, he'll rip on people, and they don't even know. Final question. Sure. When you come back... And you sit on this side of the table. Who do we have sit there? Vince Zarin. He works for a shrub. Well, he's retired. He's a cheese maker. You know, I think it's one of those things that we live in Wisconsin. You know, and I, I don't know if you just heard we won the best I did. cheese in the, the world. And we are always winning. And I think we don't realize, like, you go to France and like, oh, well, the French have the best and the you know, Italians. We don't realize we've got world-class cheese here. Well, Vince grew up as a cheese maker. He's an older gentleman. But he's just... He would be fascinating because he understands how humans took milk and converted it into something that we could make save. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, and make all these unique cheeses. And he understands it. And I, cheese making fascinates me. It's, it's like beer, it's fermentation, but it's even a little bit more unique. We're all about winning here in Green Bay. We are. We're a yeah. great city. You know, we got a good town. We're, we should be proud of, you know, can we be better? Of course, I always say that. But, um, you know, we got a nice place here. We have the number one brew pub in the world. <laughs> I know that the thing was only in the country. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm going to say in the world. <laughs> and that was USA Today. It was, yeah. So we very happy. With everybody that. should Google yeah, that. So thank you, whoever did vote for us and stuff. I, I, I voted 15,000 times. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, man. Thanks, Elliot. Brett Weicker, president of Green Bay. Don't forget to run over to iTunes and Stitcher and give a rating and review of the show. It helps other people find us. Cheers.